Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to C4C Apologetics. Uh, I'm your host, Danny, and today you got another interview with you. And, and like I said, normally uh, I love getting interviews out because I, I just love getting well knowledgeable, well educated people that are a lot smarter than me and probably a lot smarter than you, uh, their information out. But today's an interview that I'm particularly interested in as well. I'm interested in all of them, you know, but this is one that's really something for me as well, because this is looking into the Jewishness of Scripture. And what role does Jewishness play in understanding and interpreting God's Word, all 66 books of the Bible? And so with that, I have with me a good friend, uh, Hudson Smelly. And so, Hudson, I appreciate you being with us today. Uh, would you be able to share a little bit about yourself, a little bit about any ministries you're a part of? And and really, uh, what what gives you the background as far as understanding Jewishness of Scripture? Is there any Jewish influence in your life? Are you Jewish? Can you elaborate a little bit on on that before we jump into it? Sure. Uh, you know, my my background professionally is is as an attorney, uh, and uh, before getting a law degree, I studied mathematics, thinking I would get a PhD until I figured out that was the cause of migraines. Uh, but uh, th those are, are fields that, that are a benefit to me. It's, it's interesting about this Jewishness of, of Scripture. Um, I took a class called Jewish Law in uh, mm. law school, yeah. uh -huh. uh, and it was led by Jewish rabbis. And, and if, if you don't know, there's there's sort of different groups of, of uh, uh, Jewish people in terms of, of the Jewish religion. And so there's mm. conservative and, and orthodox and, and reform. But I got to hear from all of them. And, and I, frankly, I heard a lot that I never heard before, and that just further uh, bolstered something I've come to have a better appreciation for, which is the Jewishness of scriptures. And, uh, you know, in background, um, I have a teaching ministry. I've written some books, and I uh, am a co-founder of a new church in Chapel Hill, Texas, that we had our one-year anniversary a week ago. Oh. I'm very excited about that. Excellent. Now, now, do you have a, is it Mission 119? Is that is that right? That's right. I, I call it Mission 119. I put that label on my books and uh, it's on my sermon audio page just as a, you know, it, it's about Psalm 119, obviously. Okay. And my, my thing is, you know, flip the switch on and let me teach the word of God. That's the, the thing that I enjoy mm -hmm. doing most. Yeah. And yeah. it's occurred to me at some point that there's some benefit in putting some of that in writing. <laughs> yes, definitely. And, and did you mention that you had a been through a Torah school. Is that accurate? It was just, just a Jewish law class in law school, uh -huh. uh, not, not a formal Torah school. Um, I have tried to study uh, as best I can, you know, Jewish writings. I still have a lot to obviously do, to, to do in the future, but to, you know, books written by Jewish authors, mm -hmm. um, some of them Christian, some, some not. Uh, right. To get a, a better appreciation, I've, I've sought out uh, commentaries that have that Jewish background, mm -hmm. uh, and so a lot of it's just just self-taught. And um, you know, you, you get a little bit of that in seminary, but I would say, frankly, not enough. Yeah, no, I I, I totally understand. I I'm thinking of when I went through my bachelor's and my master's program uh, for college in Bible and theology, and and I can't recall much that was any Jewish influence of scripture and jewishness of scripture and so they were big in teaching the historical aspects and the literal aspects but as far as the jewish aspect of scripture and the cultural understanding i can't remember very many classes that were actually on that and taught that so but i'm really excited about this interview so like always i got a list of questions i got my red pen to make notes on different things and right off the gates i want to ask you why do you believe it's important to understand the jewishness of scripture when it comes to understanding, interpreting, and applying the Bible to our life today? Why is Jewishness uh, relevant? Sure. I mean, the, I think there's a number of reasons, but the, the bedrock, bedrock principle of interpreting the Bible correctly is understanding context. And you get different kinds of context, context internal, just uh, other things that a, that a book may say in a different place, mm -hmm. but you get external context as well. And, and we have to recognize the Bible is a Jewish book. I mean, there's just no way around it. It is a collection of, of writings over a long span of time by Jewish people, and they're going to write with their cultural precepts, their cultural outlook um, mm -hmm. in, in mind. And so uh, because of that, and, and because they tend to assume uh, a knowledge of, of Jewish concepts, like what mm -hmm. a Jewish wedding is like, um, we need to know that to better get our hands around um, their their perspective, and uh, keeping in mind, um, our job is not to 
view ourselves as the initial recipients of these uh, mm, books. Yeah. We're trying to make application of books that, that generally had an original audience in mind that was primarily Jewish. And, and so if I try to put on their sandals for a moment and hear it the way they would have heard it, yeah. understand it the way they would have understood it before I say, okay, now let's go to 2022. What do we do with this now? Right. No. Okay. Excellent. Uh, do you think it's, how much can somebody glean from the Bible without having the Jewishness understand the Jewish understanding? Do you think there's still good valid applications they can have, or does it just allow somebody to get deeper and understand fuller? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think that the Bible is not written for a seminary students. Mm -hmm. um, the Bible is written for the everyday person. Um, yeah. I think one of the bedrock principles of Scripture is what um, used to be called perspicuity. We call it clarity now. Okay. God wrote in a way that people, just real people, mm -hmm. can understand it. That said, um, just as ignoring any other context for Scripture could lead you astray or at least limit your ability to uh, interpret Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're, you're going to be able to better interpret some things with that concept in mind. Uh, when the reader's going through, for example, the book of Hebrews, and you get to chapter <laughs> three, and he mentions the word rest, yeah. that has a lot of baggage with it. Mm -hmm. And and generally, if, if we don't have some of that baggage with us from the Old Testament and right. the book of Joshua and stuff, then, then we may get some views out of that that aren't quite right. Uh, but I would never want to suggest uh, that, you know, if, if, if you haven't uh, spent time studying the Jewish background, that, that you just can't get it, or, you know, um, the Bible is written for everybody listening to this. Yeah. Now, you had made mention of Hebrews, and I just joined last week, and I joined late because I thought it was the wrong time. But you're going through on a Zoom class going over the book of Hebrews. And so I'm really looking forward to that. It's been my understanding that in order to really fully understand Hebrews, really, we should have Leviticus sort of side by side. Would that be a fair, uh, fair statement? I, I, I think so to some degree. And, yeah. and frankly, a whole lot more of, of the Old Testament. There yeah. is he, he not only writes to a Jewish audience, he writes to a Jewish audience who knows their Old Testament well. Hmm. And, and so he, he makes free use of it, but he doesn't abuse the context. And so the person who reads that book needs to go back and study what's being quoted from the Old Testament. Look at the context of that passage in the book of Genesis, if right. he's talking about Melchizedek from Genesis 12, or, or right. Genesis 14, rather, or, or in the Psalms, when he's quoting the Psalms throughout mm -hmm. uh, the first chapter, and, 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 and to, grab, to grab that. No, definitely. Uh, okay, so when we're looking at literary genres and understanding scripture from the genre in which it was written, uh, what genre would you say the Gospels are? Are they unique in themselves? And how should the Gospels be applied to the church age today? Yeah, I, I think the Gospels are a somewhat unique genre in the sense that we read them a bit like their biographies because mm -hmm. they provide biographical information. They provide a lot of facts. At the same right. time, the authors go out of their way to capture large um, uh dialogues that are instructive, they're didactic. The yeah. difference is that when we read a biography, uh, like I recently did on, on the Wright brothers, I'm reading kind of about it the whole life. There's a much more narrow purpose in the Gospels, and they each of the writers collects material with a very specific purpose and audience in mind, primarily to identify who Jesus is and tell the story of his death, burial, and resurrection, but to package it for an audience. Mm -hmm. And and so um, it's not really a biography. I mean, in okay. fact, we're told very little about what happens before his earthly ministry. Right. And, and so um, we, just, we just need to understand that um, in terms of genre. How would we apply the Gospels to the church age today? So, you know, I think you get a lot of confusion about this issue, and it's right. been made harder than what it should be. Every Gospel was written after the resurrection. We know that because it records the resurrection. Right. Um, they were therefore written during what, you know, from a dispensational standpoint, we would call the church age, which means they are written for people in the church age. They are all for evangelistic, so they all have in mind that an unsaved person, a non-Christian, might read it and, uh, and might be brought to, to faith, but also okay. that a Christian could read it and, 
and, and learn from it as well. Right. At the same time, and here's where the confusion comes in, is, is it's using events that are all before the cross when the law of Moses was still in effect. We're right. told Jesus kept the law perfectly, and he's often getting questions and teaching about uh, theological matters raised by the Pharisees or raised by somebody else saying, what's the answer under the law of Moses? Right. So we have to be careful um, uh, that, that, that that teaching will always have application, but it may not be a direct application because I'm not taking uh, an animal to church this Sunday. Right. <laughs> no, definitely. But back then you would bring an animal to church, if you will, because being under the law and sacrificial system, right? It, it, exactly. It's my. It's the reason I say, and at the end of the day, everybody's really a dispensationalist. No, that's that's true. And I've heard the argument too, and think there's a, a misunderstanding of tithing. You know, and my understanding and my belief in tithing was that was a mosaic law uh, issue. It was a law of the tithe, too, during the nation of Israel. And if people wanted to tithe according to scripture, it would roughly be about 23 percent and include fruits, vegetables and animals and livestock, too. Yeah, no, it, it would. And, and I would say to anyone, you know, listening uh, from my, you know, to this, from my standpoint, if, if you feel a conviction about tithing, you you certainly should do it. Yeah. Um, I, I think that the New Testament is telling us to to that we should be cheerful givers. It ought to re, our giving is a man, a manner of worship where it should reflect our heart attitude. Yeah. And and it's been my discovery that that you can you can have a church where you like the one where I'm a, an elder. We've we've said no, we've never asked for money. We've never taught tithing. Uh, I'm not saying that we're against the concept and just and yet the money's there. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Uh, Right, the, the the church will not go broke without without teaching uh, right. that that doctrine. But I have some people in my life that I highly respect, and it's mm -hmm. been a very important conviction to them that they have for all of their adult life uh, faithfully tithed, and and I applaud that, and uh, yeah. and that's a that that's a fine conviction. So. No, oh, definitely. I love what Randy Alcorn says, if I could paraphrase him, that uh, the the ten percent tithe should should really be at least like maybe a a uh, a starting point. And then what the New Testament teaches grace giving. And then as a Christian spiritually matures and the conviction happens that you can go and really 10% uh, tithe can at times be very restrictive when God is trying to give a, uh, lead us to give more too. And so, yeah. but yeah, if everybody in the church would give at least the 10% tithe, hey, churches around there'd be enough money to go to the missionaries and to feed the homeless and clothe them and, and pay but, the preacher. <laughs> exactly. That too. Um, but, so the, the first person who ever taught me free grace, uh, and it was a, a, a big influence. He's passed away in 2015, but his thing on giving, he said, it's grace giving, give as your lead right on the memo. God, this is what I think of. Yeah, no, yeah, definitely. And, and, and that was like, well, maybe 10% is not enough. Right? <laughs> No, definitely. But then at the same time, if, if you don't want to give anything, Paul tells us in the New Testament not to give, you right. know, don't give grudgingly. And so but definitely, I'm sorry, a yeah. little rabbit trail, you know, I don't normally get on rabbit trails in interviews, but it was, it was interesting when I wanted to go down, but you were talking about gospels and you were talking about uh, somewhat of audiences. Now, it's commonly understood or commonly believed that Luke's audience was Greek, Mark's audience was Roman, John was world, and Matthew was written to the Jewish audience. Now, since this is an interview specifically about the Jewishness of Scripture, and it doesn't clearly say in the book or the Gospel of Matthew that, hey, this I'm writing to the Jewish people, why is the belief that Matthew was written primarily to a Jewish audience? Yeah, I think there's a number of, of indicators on on that uh, in in Matthew. Uh, one, what comes out of that book as you read the whole thing as a unit is a twin purpose that I think is somewhat unique to, to Matthew. One of those purposes is to explain what about the kingdom. Um, mm -hmm. This was a big shock to a Jewish reader that the Messiah would come and not immediately implement the kingdom. When you read the Gospels, even the disciples expected that. When you read Luke, as they're coming into Jerusalem for the last time, it was because they thought the kingdom would immediately appear that he begins teaching them again, hey, it's not going to happen. So you've got to explain that. But the bigger problem uh, tackled in, in Matthew is, you know, you have to preach to your culture. Any missionary knows that. 
Jesus's culture was drenched in this Pharisaic works soteriology. Mm -hmm. And so his first message out of the box, and it's not at the beginning of his earthly ministry because Matthew doesn't care about that. He, he cares about the, the, the subject matter. And the first message out of the box is the box of the Sermon on the Mount, which is all about um, dealing with that uh, flawed theology. A Gentile audience doesn't need to have their theology corrected in that way because that's not their theology. This is this is prepackaged for um, a Jewish people. Um, you know, some other ideas about it is is that um, just everything in between is pervasively Jewish. It's full of um, Old Testament references, and it also cites them in a unique way that I think causes some exegetical problems, because I'm not aware of another book in the New Testament that does this. Mm -hmm. But for example, Matthew will um, cite something in the Old Testament from, say, the book of Hosea, out of Egypt, I've called my son. Um, mm -hmm. When you're reading Hosea, that's talking about God pulling uh, Israel out of Egypt from their bondage. It's not talking about Jesus. But Matthew applies it that way. It's not even it's not even indicated to be a prophetic statement. Yet he finds a typical fulfillment in Christ, and he'll say this was fulfilled. He talks about Rachel weeping for her sheep. He yeah. talks about Jonah being in the belly of the well for three days and three nights. Yeah. And 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 he uses these in a in a in a more typical fashion, which is a Jewish manner, a rabbinic manner of of teaching. He often takes the position of the rabbi. He sits and teaches gathers people up on the mountain, sits down, teaches that sort of thing. Right. Um, there's, there's an extraordinarily heavy focus in Matthew, especially beginning in uh, chapter 12, on judgment on that generation of Israel. It's the reason he begins preaching in parables. Um, there's a lot of judgment between chapter 12 and chapter 23. Chapter 23 is just, um, it's dark. I mean, it's a tough chapter to read if you're the yeah. one on the receipt, receiving end. Why does a Gentile need that? Right. right. It's, you know, it becomes apparent um, at some point it's like reading the instructions and realizing that because they're in English, they're actually for the English speaking world. Mm. And this is this is written Jewish for the Jewish world. Definitely. One of the things also that uh, really gave me gave me clarity is when everybody uh, wants to find out, OK, what day was Jesus crucified? You know, it's fascinating when I when I did this personal study, and and I think it ties into what you're saying, the Jewishness of of the Gospel of Matthew, is if we read about when Jesus uh, prophesies or when the Gospel writers say that Jesus will rise, Mark, Luke, and John talk about he will rise on the third day. The third day, that's all they will say. Only in the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 12, does Jesus say three days and three nights. And... It doesn't say the third day. And so when I'm looking at the Jewish idioms and see that it's a figure of speech, that there's a clear way to rise on the third day, as well as have three days and three nights. And the fact that the Jewish concept, correct me if I'm wrong, of a ona, meaning any part of the day can be considered the whole day. And so it doesn't contradict each other. It's another aspect of the Jewish figure of speech Matthew gives that, like you said earlier, it it's assumed to the audience they already know what he's talking about. And so did you have something you wanted to say about that? It, no, I, 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 I agree with that. And I, it, it's, it's not, it, this is a peripheral issue that's fighting words for some people, unfortunately, what day did Jesus die? Right. Um, he had to die on the Passover. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. And any point of view that puts it any other day is simply wrong. He had to be resurrected on the feast day of the Shiva first fruits. Any other uh, viewpoint that puts it any other day is wrong. He has to fulfill scripture. But but that said, um, you know, the three days and three nights thing is usually um, argued by many to, to say it's a literal 72 hours. They would then argue for a Wednesday or Thursday. Um, right. There's a few problems with that. But one of them is whatever day you put it, you have to think about what year that happened and what day in that year the Passover occurred. You have a pretty good idea of those those events. And so it needs to fall on a Passover day. But the other thing is, like I said, uh, Matthew several times uses Old Testament statements that are not prophecies. Yeah. But he makes them sound like a prophecy because he says this is going to be fulfilled in Christ in a the typical fashion. And that's how Jonah is. When you fulfill something in a typical fashion, it doesn't need to have exactitude. 
the idea is one thing is like the other, not that one thing is exactly like the other. Right. And so there, there, there need, there need not be uh, three literal days and, and three literal nights in any event, but then the Jewish understanding of that would have simply been parts of three days. If that expression is used that way in the book of Esther. Yeah, that's true. Yep. Yeah, beginning of, I think it's the beginning of Esther when there was that aspect of, I think the fast or whatnot, yeah, but when she proclaims a three day fast and it doesn't, it just doesn't mean that. And, and I would say this too, no one can actually make it exactly 72 hours because it's a greedy diet at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. So there's no way to get exactly 72 hours and land it at a, at a, at a morning, a Sunday morning resurrection. Especially with the Jewish Day of Reckoning happening when the first three stars in the night sky or whatever the case yeah. is. you I, I, If you don't want to answer this, that's fine. I mean, a bunch of rabbit trails, like I said, I was excited about this interview. Jonah, did he die mm -hmm. in the belly of the whale or, or was it all metaphorical? What are your thoughts? Um, no, he, he did not die in the belly of the well, in my opinion. Not fighting words, it's peripheral. Uh -huh. um, my main thing about Jonah mm -hmm. is I read something a long time ago, and I quoted it in a book I've written on Jonah, and that is that it's the most misunderstood book of the Bible. Mm -hmm. It's an extraordinarily simple book, and it's the poster child for people not saying, what is the context here? What, who's the audience? Like, right. who is the audience of the book of Jonah? And so you hear very wonderful, uh, moving sermons on, on missions work from the book of Jonah. That's mm -hmm. not what the book's about, unfortunately. It's a great sermon. It's just the wrong passage. Well, and, and, and to not know the audience, it's the same problem we're talking about with the Gospel of Matthew. To not put yourself in that Jewish audience in the first century mm -hmm. is, is uh, you know, is, is a mistake because you're going to miss something. With Jonah, you've got to put yourself in, in the standpoint of the northern kingdom that at that point in the Old Testament is called Israel and say, right. Somehow, whatever happened to Jonah is a message to the northern kingdom. And anyway, so it just that's a, that's a rabbit trail, too. But it's just to say that that book gets misunderstood. And I would offer to you that Jesus tells us in the Gospel of Matthew how to rightly interpret Jonah. Because mm. he says, Jonah went over there to Syria with five words in his mouth, and they all repented immediately in sackcloth and ashes. I have come to you doing extraordinary things, and you won't listen. That's the interpretation of Jonah. Yeah, no, that's definitely huge, definitely. Uh, <clears throat> mentioning Jonah, I want to get to Matthew chapter 12. I think this is a uh, uh, discussion that's another one that's highly misunderstood because a lot of times it's not coming from a Jewish perspective. And I have a lot of questions that we're going to start getting into the Jewish aspect of these passages and how that provides clarity. And so Matthew chapter 12, the unpardonable sin. And so I want to go ahead and, and read a little bit about this. And so we have uh, Matthew chapter 12 in verse 31. Jesus says, and I, I like the King James, but uh, wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And so here we get this understanding of the unpardonable sin, a sin that's committed against the Holy Spirit, not against Father, not against Son, but sin that's committed against the Holy Spirit that Jesus himself says will never be forgiven. What mm -hmm. is this unpardonable sin? And is this something somebody can actually commit today? Yeah, I, I think uh, the answer to the second question is an easy one for me. And the answer is no, you can't commit it today. Um, I, I think it's important to recognize that this is one of those verses or passages. It's so easy to just pull out. And, and that sort of proof text kind of theology mm. um, is, is just not a good way of doing it. And it, it occurs within this wonderful hinge point in Matthew. Matthew right. is a crescendo within the book where there's a turning point and, and Jesus begins to, to uh, set out judgment because characteristically, not everybody, but characteristically, they have rejected his message that he is the Christ. Mm -hmm. And because of that, in Matthew 13, he will begin teaching deep secrets about the kingdom that have never been revealed in the Old Testament, but he will do so in parables as a judgment on that generation to hide the truth from those that have rejected him as the Christ. You say, well, how did they reject him? He came doing the things the Old Testament said he would do, and he did it by the power of the Holy Spirit. And their sin was to witness those miracles and to say, 
the devil did that. Mm-hmm. That was the power of Satan. And so it's blasphemy because they're equating the Holy Spirit with, with Satan in a, in a hypocritical way because as he says, you know, by, by what power do your own son do that? In other words, you've, you've got people yeah. that claim to be able to do exorcisms. Um, so the sin is is a very specific one. It's it's witnessing Jesus's earthly ministry and how he did validating miracles of being right. the Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, and they have rejected it. Now, I will say this. I do not take this to mean that anybody that was there that day who was rejecting Christ at that moment would never have a uh, an opportunity in their life to come to faith. I don't think that's the point at all. I think the point rather is, um, you know, is, is if you persist in this, there will not be forgiveness now or in the future. No. The now will come with the judgment that will fall in AD 70. And of course, if, if, if one goes to the grave, having rejected Christ, then they're, they're going to have an eternal destiny apart from him. Yeah. No, I, I love the fact that you draw out the reason of parables. So many times I, I'll hear well-meaning, well-intentioned preachers say that uh, Jesus spoke in parables to reveal just spiritual truth and application and and but really that's ignoring the context. That's ignoring uh, messages like I believe it's in the book of Isaiah. Uh, that that gives insight that this is going to happen. It's actually fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, I love parallel uh, Bibles. I love taking the Gospels and the harmony of the Gospels and and looking at okay, if this is an account in the Gospels that multiple writers write about, I want to look at all the Gospels to see what do each Gospel ri- uh, writer record about the event. And so many times, everybody focuses on Matthew twelve and the unpardonable sin. And one of the things I think people always overlook is Mark's account of it. Because uh-huh. when we get to Mark chapter 3, verse 29, Jesus says, But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost has never, never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. And then verse 30, Mark inserts a statement, Because they said he has an unclean spirit. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's, to me, it's so interesting and so fascinating the fact that Mark records the unpardonable sin in just one verse and the fact that those people said he was doing this with a, a demonic spirit. And so it, it, would that be a fair understanding on my side, you believe? Oh, yeah, I, no, I think so. And, you know, Mark's our author that just, I mean, <laughs> he's just move, move, move. Yes, he does. It's action, a, it's action book. It's a, it's, it's a, um, you know, he does have that very Roman audience in, in view, probably, and Jesus is is a, a man of action, and it's very fast, and immediately mm-hmm. he did this and did that. But, you know, it gives you that insight. I mean, they're saying in, in Matthew and Mark that, that Jesus is using the power of Satan, that he, in fact, himself, I suppose, yeah. is is um, the one with the demon. And uh, but But for Matthew's point, you know, you're you're equating the Holy Spirit to to the to Satan. That's yeah. that's the unpardonable sin, mm-hmm. and and in the re, the way in which it can't be done today is because I think it has to do with rejecting Christ mm-hmm. on that basis. Uh, you know, and, it, and it's that generation, and and it, I say that in a large part because it's what I mentioned about chapter thirteen. The judgment begins literally at that moment, like mm-hmm. like that's the. 12 and 13 are a unit, and he just immediately goes into uh, this judgment. And his, his, you know, his, his disciples come to him, why are you teaching them parables? He's like, because you get to know some truth about the kingdom, and they don't. It's to reveal and conceal, and, and that is the direct response. That's the way in which immediately they're not being forgiven in this time. But could someone who rejected him come to faith later? Well, sure. Nicodemus did that. Right. Now, would that be the reason why we can read that uh, there's the phrase, he that has ears, let him hear? Is that that spiritual understanding or is that something else? It, it is. His whole point in saying he who has ears, let him hear, is is that some people can understand it and some can't. And yeah. um, this is not a uh, like a Calvinist total inability doctrine. In fact, it actually uh, re- rebuts that completely. Yeah. Um, if, if if there's total inability, as Calvinists or Reforms uh, folks would teach, then there was no need for Jesus to use parables to hide the truth. That's a good uh, point. Right. So so w- what he's really saying is judgment. 
those people who have not accepted him as the Christ are not going to get this. And, you know, Paul makes that application to Christians in, in 1 mm -hmm. Corinthians 3, that there are Christians, he says, who cannot eat a steak dinner. Okay, they've got to have milk from a bottle. Uh, the author of Hebrews picks up the same thing in, in chapter 5 of his book. He says, I want to teach you about deep, deep truths about Melchizedek from Genesis, and uh, but you can't take it. Yeah. You know, and at the end of that chapter, he talks about the milk meat thing, makes him sound like he might be Paul. I don't think he was, but it, mm -hmm. he, he probably knew Paul. Some would suggest he was Luke, but you get that idea. So even as a Christian, right. our behavior may impact our capacity to um, comprehend more truth from God. Definitely, definitely. Uh, moving on with some more Jewish understanding of passages, I want to get into Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. It's the parable of the wheat and the tares. Could you explain what's going on with this and the wheat and the tares? And in verse number 30, where Jesus says, let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I'll say to the reapers, gather together first the tares, bind them in bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Uh, what's happening? What is the wheat and the tares? And what application does this have for today? Yeah, it, it, one, it's a fascinating passage. One of the things I'll, I'll stress when I teach um, any book of the Bible, but especially Matthew, which I finished teaching just, just a couple of weeks back, actually, uh -huh. through the whole thing, and or through most of it, is, is structure. We, we right. need to look, when we're looking at context, we look at the structure, and one of the things that we see is chapter 13 is full of parables, mm -hmm. but the first one about the sower is more of an introduction to why he's teaching in parables, and then what follows he says, these are kingdom parables. That's the subject matter. Um, that doesn't mean that they say nothing about today, but they are directed at teaching about the kingdom. What do parables do? Parables teach by analogy. Simple, mm -hmm. simple parables will have one primary analogy. More complex ones like, like the parable of the uh, so-called prodigal son may have a few analogies, but they're not allegories. So I don't want to look at each word and say, what does this word symbolize? And what does that word symbolize? Right. I want to see what the analogy is. Remember what's happened. In chapter 12, he has begun to pronounce judgment on that generation. Right. And, and he's telling them that this kingdom is going to be removed from you. And it, and it becomes more pronounced as the book proceeds. Matthew 23 is quite specific. And so um, his disciples and the Jewish audience in general expect that when the Christ comes, the kingdom gets implemented right away. Mm -hmm. This parable is to tell them it's going to be delayed. Like that is the primary purpose. And while it's delayed, the wheat and the tares, children of the kingdom, meaning saved people, Christians, we would say now, but saved people, believers, and, and children of Satan, um, will, will essentially be allowed to prosper together. Um, the harvest is, is the final judgment, and, and this parallels and relates to Matthew 25 with the sheep and goats. It's the same subject matter using different language. And so the harvest is that final judgment after which, you know, one group is in the kingdom and one's not. It's binary throughout Matthew, but, but the, the audience just needed to get, hey, this kingdom is delayed. Yeah. For us, that's not a big deal. For them, that's a big deal. That's a shocking teaching. You mean the kingdom's not now? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're thinking all throughout the Gospels. His apostles are thinking, is it now? Is it now? Right. Uh -huh. Right? And he says, no, it's not now. And, and so for, for us in the church age, it's just telling us, that um, the kingdom's delayed, a judgment's coming, but God is going to permit um, believers and non-believers more or less to prosper during this age. The, 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 the judgment, the, the vengeance of God will be future. Is this the big hangup within uh, Judaism and the fact that why they don't believe Jesus is the Messiah because of the delaying of the Messianic kingdom? Is that their main hangup with Jesus? I, th I think the hangup's more serious than that, and, and we okay. see it in um, the Gospels. We see it, for example, in John 5. You know, you see it in a number of places, but in John 5, they start picking up rocks because they, they realize that by calling himself the Son, by uh, referring to my Father, not our Father, which would have been right. a more Jewish expression, our Father, not my Father, they say, wait a second, he's claiming equality with God. At the end of the day, they killed him. Because he was the son of God, not because he was a good teacher, not because uh, he fed the 5,000. They killed him because he claimed to be God. And so you have these people say, well, he never claimed to be God. He died for <laughs> claiming to be God. 
right? That is, and the and you think about how John's gospel unfolds. The ultimate lighting, the final fuse, is raising Lazarus. When you're reading Matthew, he kind of goes after Matthew 12. He he he, he re- refrains from a lot of public ministry. It becomes much more restrained. Right. Yet right at the very end, only recorded in, in in John, he heals Lazarus from the dead, and he makes a big public spectacle. It was on CNN. It was on Fox. Everybody knew about it, and that's why they think, in their Jewish mindset, we'll probably talk about this later, they think Feast of Tabernacles, even though they're there for Passover, and they start cutting palm leaves, which have nothing to do with Passover. They had to do with the Tabernacles and mm-hmm. throwing them on the ground. Why? Because they started saying this guy might be God. He's raising dead folks. Yeah. Interesting. You know, that's, that's fascinating. <laughs> he knew when he raised Lazarus, they would kill him for it. And they did. Yeah. And then nowadays, even today in modern Judaism, yeah, were, were they just looking for a Messiah that would deliver them from Rome? Well, and is it I more think, than think that? It, it, it's a, it's a, I think it's a problem fundamentally for two reasons. He, he claimed to be God and they, and they struggle with that Trinitarian idea. In Judaism, even today. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It, the Trinitarian idea, which, which by the way, is also uh, true of Islam. They, they would say, you know, if you talk to, about it, you know, you, you know, you're, how can you have this? There's three gods. And then we, we think there's one God. And of course, as Christians, we're saying, no, there's one God, but you have to quit thinking of him in human terms. Right. He's bigger than that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I know, like, it, Muslims, they have this misconstrued idea that our view of Trinity uh, includes Mary within that Trinitarian group as well. We got an interview, about a two-hour-plus interview on a on an apologist on Muslims, or Islam, if you will, and really goes into that in great detail. So it's quite interesting, just the misunderstanding and caricature, if you will, of Christianity and the Trinity, but... There's, there's, there's probably a lesson in there for that, for, for those of us that have the, you know, the time to do it, which is we ought to better understand what they're saying. I'm not suggesting that what they're saying is correct. I think it's right. not. Um, but most Christians have some conceptions. They haven't read the Quran, for example. Um, I, and I have this years ago. Um, but, but to do a little bit of study and get a little bit of idea of, of, mm-hmm. of what that's about. And there's an excellent book by Nabil Qureshi about his coming out of Islam and becoming a Christian that gives you, um, it gives you the mindset. It's just like us talking about the Jewishness of Matthew. How do you, if you can step into their mindset, you can better understand how you might evangelize them. That's what Jesus had to do in Matthew. Of course, he already had that understanding, made it easier. Right. Yeah. Nabil's book, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. Yeah. Excellent book. Nothing but great things about that. And and unfortunately, I, I believe he had passed away uh, a little bit ago from cancer, I think it was. He, but... he died, died here in Houston in, in the hospital, fairly young age, but um, a powerful a testimony, not only about him, but his good friend and some others, people names you would know, like Gary Habermas and, yep. and uh, I think Mike Stallard, that that um, ministered to him along the way Mm -hmm. and uh but all of them had some understanding of where he was coming from and that allowed them to be more um, effective and that's why so i mean we we should we should you know we can be critical of well they don't understand us and that's true Mm -hmm. um often we don't understand them either so (laughs) yeah well it's true i i the fact on watching some videos from nabil while he was in the hospital uh on his deathbed and just the 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 strength in his faith that he had to the very end that the video showed and I believe he held on to it was just powerful yeah. testimony you know uh, and so yeah all right Matthew twenty four thirty four so now we're getting into the Olivet discourse I do believe that a lot of uh, personally speaking I do believe a lot of the Olivet discourse is misunderstood especially when uh, Jesus says he that endures to the end will be saved I look at that personally uh, as far as similar to Habakkuk when he was told to write uh, on a tablet that way when people run they can see and understand what it's saying to escape babylonian judgment stuff like that i believe that's in reference to ad 70 so having a jewish and an old testament understanding but in matthew 24 34 there's a verse that uh in parable of the fig tree jesus says this generation shall not pass to all these things be fulfilled who is this generation 
is it talking about those people then at Jesus's day will not die until all those things fulfill or who is this? Yeah, I think that the short answer is it's not that generation. It's the generation that sees as the parable of the fig tree announces the sprout come up. Mm -hmm. um, that is a, a symbolic of them seeing all the signs. Uh, you had to put this, this thing in context. I, I, I might have said it earlier, but the Olivet Discourse and the Sermon on the Mount are bookends on Jesus' earthly ministry and Matthew's organization of, of uh, the book. They're okay. very significant. He intentionally puts, you know, the, the, the public teaching ministry in these bookends, the first one about soteriology primarily, although Matthew 7 addresses the, the final judgment, and then, and then all of that discourse, which answers not the question that was quite asked, which is when will the kingdom come? When will you return? But how will you see it ahead of time because you're watching for the signs? And, and uh, another important thing to, to point out is that, that I think many people miss. Matthew 10 is a parallel to Matthew 24 and 25. You need to read them side by side. Matthew 10 begins with Jesus sending out his, his disciples to do evangelism. But then at, at about verse 16, he jumps to things future that goes even beyond the lives of his disciples to the tribulation period when the disciples of Christ will do tremendous evangelism. Okay, and be persecuted for it. The Sermon on the, uh, the Olivet Discourse does the same thing. It starts now and immediately begins looking forward. And it starts on the heels of a, of a very important statement Jesus made in Matthew 23, 39, which he says, you're not going to see me again until you say, you, the nation of Israel, say, he who comes in the name of the Lord is the blessed one. That is why you know it wasn't that generation. They never did it. That generation instead got judged in AD 70. They never said as a generation characteristically fulfilling Zechariah 13 and other passages. And of course, the, the Psalm 118, um, he who comes in the name of the Lord, um, you, you know, is, you know, or blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Right. So that's what sort of sets you up. And it's why his disciples start saying, when will all these things happen? Mm -hmm. Yes, he speaks to them, but the prophets of the Old Testament frequently spoke about future things to a group of people who wouldn't be there to see them to a people who wouldn't be there to, to see a virgin birth, okay? He, that, there's nothing uncommon about that. In fact, it's very typical. So he, he speaks to uh, one generation people as representative, um, you know, for, for a future one. As it unfolds, though, he's giving all these signs that lead up to his return. Mm -hmm. um, when you say this generation and you try to place it in the first century, they have to be witnesses both to Matthew 10 and Matthew 24, to the national revival of Israel that's promised frequently in the Old Testament, as well as those judgments. Those things did not happen, nor should we have expected them, um, you know, to, to happen. And so um, I think that's the point really is in a big way, Matthew 24 is for a future audience to have some discernment and say, well, why? But think about this. Why would he spend so much time telling um, his audience when certain events happen run? Because the future audience that's ready for him, they weren't ready for him the first time. They largely rejected him as the Christ. The future audience will be ready. They'll read the words, understand and believe. They'll have ears to hear. And they'll say, you know what? Now it's time to run. Right. No, we, we see that in, uh, in different aspects in the Old Testament and then even in the book of Revelation as well. So I guess it's safe to say that when Jesus was writing this in Matthew 24, that Jesus knew scripture would be recorded and written down. And so he said these words and spirit made sure these words were in the canon to go ahead and, you know, give information to this future generation. And so uh, staying in all of it discourse and a lot of times for us, chapters and divisions while they are a blessing as far as references are concerned but they really do damage and understanding context and especially yeah. in epistles we're like okay we're in chapter two chapter one's over but ignoring the fact that chapter one still continues into chapter two so we need to keep reading it so chapter and verses are great for references but trying to understand the context as a whole not so much uh, if Matthew 25 is still part of the Olivet Discourse, 
Could you explain the sheep and goats judgment in Matthew 25 verses 31 and through 46? And I got a couple questions real quick on that. And yeah. so uh, I'd really like to have each of these answered. Uh, first, is this a works based salvation when Jesus is talking about giving a cup to somebody? Uh, you've given it to him. Is this applicable today during the church age? And does this mean if we serve and minister to the poor that we can escape hell? Now, I know I have, it sounds like a political debate question. I got three questions on there. So I do want to look at each of them. Yeah. I'm excited. No, no, let's, let's look at each of them. So um, uh, it's helpful to recognize that Matthew 24 and 25 go together as a unit. It's also helpful as you're going through it to see the bigger structure. I've mentioned one thing, which is the bookends, as I talked about with the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7, does talk about judgment. It talks about the final judgment. It uses very specific language, only mentioned two times, one time in Matthew 7. He, he sends people away. He says, I don't know you. And then in Matthew uh, 25, with the um, parable of the uh, the ten young ladies or the ten young virgins, he mm -hmm. uses the same language. So you, you'll see these tie-ins. They're they're important. Primarily, Matthew 24 is providing the signs of his coming. It culminates in what's called the sign of the Son of Man. Uh, there's a lot of debate about what that is. I think the last chapter of Zechariah actually uh, specifically addresses it. And I think everything is dark up until that point, and it turns light. And then Jesus says, okay, now you know when the fig tree sprouts, summer's near. Mm -hmm. You know when these signs happen, my coming is, is at hand. Mm -hmm. And so watch. That would only make sense for believers to do that. But I think as people become believers in the future generation, they're looking. And then he tells a series of parables, all of which, and they're all hard parables. They're challenging, and, they're, and I would say they're largely misunderstood. Mm -hmm. The point of every parable and every analogy from the fig tree to the, to the parable of the talents is be ready when I come. Like, that's it. Be ready. What does that mean? Well, you better have accepted him as Christ so that you will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. That's the manner in which you be ready. Then he gets to this, this, he gets out of parable stage and out of analogies, but he does use figurative language about sheep and goats and cups of water and, and feeding people and all that. Um, this is where the tie-in to Matthew 10 is critical. When Matthew 10, the focus is not so much on the judgment as it is on the evangelization of, of Israel in that, in that tribulation period of time. And, and when you're reading Matthew 10, he, he basically ends, and I'll, I'll read a couple of verses. These are key. Matthew 10, 40. The one who welcomes you welcomes me. Oh, wait a second. This isn't just about being hospitable to people. Mm -hmm. You welcome that man into your home because you've accepted his message. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening, as opposed to those who reject his message and persecute him. Those who welcome his disciples welcome me, and the one who welcomes me welcomes him who sent me. See, so so this this is an evangelistic statement used in in the, in, in a cultural context of hospitality. It, they had such a strong sense of hospitality; it was so much a part of the culture. You didn't go stay at the Marriott when you traveled. Um, it was right. so much part of a culture that, you know, one of John's letters, he had to say, look, when some of these guys come knocking on your door on Saturday morning, don't let them in the house. Right. Uh, but but uh, so so he says that. Then he says anyone who welcomes a prophet because he's a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. OK. And he kind of steps it up. Anyone who welcomes a righteous man because he's righteous will receive a righteous person's reward. But whoever gives a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, who's that? His disciples, his his people that he sends out to evangelize. See, and we know that because he says, because he is a disciple, mm -hmm. I assure you, he will never lose his reward. The idea is he will be in the kingdom and rewarded for his a good conduct. Um, mm -hmm. It's not that the conduct has gotten him there, by the way. The point is that that just little bit of faith, that just little bit of willingness to hand a cup, a cup of cold water, it was recognition that you accepted their message. And so, in fact, we're talking about faith. All of Matthew is about faith. Jesus spent such a long time in Matthew 5 and 6 tearing down works theology, saying, listen, if you're not more righteous, Matthew 5, than the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never be in the kingdom. And, and the, we're all looking around saying there ain't many people around here more righteous than these Pharisees. <laughs> right. yeah. And then somebody probably said, well, you know, I feel pretty good about myself. I can be better than them. And then Jesus steps it up and says, no, 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 you misunderstand me. you got to be perfect. 
yeah. just like God. Yeah. And, and, and you're supposed to realize by the end of, of chapter seven, I can't do it. It's going to have to be the narrow gate of faith, not the wide gate of trying to earn it. Mm. And so when you get to Matthew 25, he picks up that language from Matthew 10 that he's already given us the deciphering code to about giving a cup of cold water. And that has to do with how you welcome his disciples who in that context have been sent out with the gospel message. And to welcome them is to, met, is to welcome Jesus because it's to welcome him as the Christ. And to welcome mm-hmm. him as the Christ is to welcome the Father. So we get to Matthew 25, and when he says, you know, one group, you know, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was in prison, you know, thirsty, you didn't give me something to drink. I was in prison. I was naked. You didn't take care of me. Uh, and the other group, he says, you did. And both groups say, we never did that because right. what are they doing? They're trying to take it literally. And this is important. Because the very false teaching that people use from this chapter is Mm -hmm. based on taking the viewpoint of the ones Jesus says, no, 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 you misunderstand me. They say, Lord, we never did that for you. And he says, no, 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 don't think literally. This isn't literally. It was when you did it for one of my, look what he says, these brothers of mine, verse 40, chapter 25, verse 40. Who are these brothers? They're the same same as chapter 10. And as I said earlier, he's looking future, so it's beyond even the apostles' lifetimes but it is his disciples. And, you know, if we want to go outside of Matthew, we might get to Revelation 7 or 14 with the evangelists. It's those people who, who you have welcomed because you welcome their message. And um, whatever you did, do not, you know, verse 45, whatever you didn't do for the least of these, why, why would you do it? Because you rejected their message. So, um, the Bible teaches in spades that we ought to do for the poor, and it's probably one of the biggest faults of conservative Christians is convincing themselves that the, the message of the New Testament is just about um, our uh, eternal destiny. And uh, when James says pure and undefiled religion is taking care of the widows and orphans, we ought to be serious about that, right. but not because we think that's what's validating, earning, or um, keeping our salvation. So as far as, uh, so it sounds like this is not, dealing with the church age is that correct would this be a look towards the tribulation period you mentioned uh, oh. the 144,000 evangelists jewish evangelists I, I i personally take the view that that nothing in matthew 24 is about the church at all uh, there are those right. who take it that way they um when when he speaks of noah's flood mm-hmm. which is an analogy to the judgment of the flood how it swept people away they misconstrue that to mean the opposite, and they're being swept up into heaven through a rapture. Mm-hmm. Um, that's coming to a Jewish book with a Gentile uh, shoes right. on, and it's a mistake. Mm-hmm. But that said, this judgment at the end of the tribulation period will incorporate, as he says, he brings all the nations. So whoever's alive, it will be Jew and Gentile mm-hmm. uh, that will come to this judgment if they're alive at that time. Now, the other question I had... Uh as far as works based and i don't i don't hold the view in james chapter two where a genuine believer will uh show their works and justify themselves before god by their works i I don't take that view i don't believe you do as well uh would this passage here in matthew 25 as far as the the sheep and the goats is this revealing that a true believer would do these works or what would you say about that no, I, I think, you know, p- part of the problem is, is like when somebody tells me Jesus never claims to be God, I would say that he <laughs> claims to be God over and over. What your complaint is, is he doesn't say it the way you would say it in 2022. Right. He says it the way a Jewish rabbi would say it in the first century. Right. So when he speaks here, he is, as he was throughout Matthew 25, using analogies. He's using Uh, imagery they understand, and they understand hospitality. And you show hospitality to a traveling teacher whose message you accept and appreciate. And so they're going to show hospitality to these people. It's not the hospitality that is the saving feature. It's simply um, a a way of of describing to them that they've accepted the message. Um, I don't think you can uh, rightfully divide this and get out of it that these things are required for the salvation. Um, you know, and it's interesting that, you know, it, it, whether it's him in prison or him hungry or him not clothed or him needing a cup of water, that just little bit of hospitality, that just little ounce of faith that he's the Christ mm-hmm. is all it is. 
And this matches, and this is why it's important, the part I mentioned earlier about what, what comes before this. Every parable and every analogy is saying, be ready. And when the 10 young virgins, five of them are not ready, they're not sent away because they, you know, right, they didn't have oil in their lamps. But what was the problem? They knocked on the door and he said, depart from me. I never knew you. There was no relationship. That's the word from Matthew 7. Every one of those parables is about somebody not being ready when he returns. And the way to be ready is to be the person who in their heart, Matthew 23, says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, you, which is a messianic verse. You recognize him as the Christ. These people in the first century, when he sent them out in, in Matthew 10, they were teaching the same message he preached, which was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Mm -hmm. And it, that was a shorthand for saying, look, the, the Christ has shown up. Mm -hmm. You know, the Messiah is here. We are that close to the kingdom. And that message was largely rejected. And, and uh, so the idea is the second time around, you would be ready because you will not have rejected that message. You will have welcomed the messenger, therefore welcomed the person the message is about, therefore welcomed the father that sent him. Okay. So sounds like, uh, like you're mentioning, this is really an analogy, if you will. Uh, like, so from understanding it from a Jewish perspective, as far as receiving itinerant preachers, and if you receive their message, you have that aspect of hospitality. I think Hebrews talks about it. And like you said, one of the letters of John mentions, you know, uh, don't uh, bid a false teacher in by in doing so, you know, you'll be partakers of his evil deeds, things like that. And don't wish him Godspeed, stuff like that. Then when we get to earlier passages in Matthew, where it talks about if the house be worthy, uh, when, when they go yeah. out and evangelize, it's. It is an aspect of understanding the Jewish concept of receiving a message of hospitality analog uh, analogous to receiving a message. And so by doing this, and like you said, uh, the least of these, my brethren, it's analogous to receiving the message of the brethren and yeah. uh, not and, proving and, a lordship works. Well, in, in that last point about the brethren, Right. If you wanted to teach that you need to take care of the poor, mm -hmm. he, he would teach it. He's not talking about the poor. He's right. talking about his brethren. Right. These of mine. So it's a specific group. It's the group that is sent out with a messianic message, the gospel. And and as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, taking care of the poor. And, and to be clear, I don't want anyone to misunderstand. That's a great sermon about about doing more for people that are in need. Right. Um, oh, yeah. God expects us to do those things. And it's mm -hmm. a great sermon to preach and you should preach it. Just don't preach it from Matthew 25. Mm -hmm. Rightly divide the text. There's lots of verses you can pick from where 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 you can you can teach. Uh, I mean, that I mean, how many times in the New Testament does it say love one another? Right. I mean, James, you reference James, too. He uses a specific example of someone destitute showing up at your door. Your fridge is full of food. Your closet's full of clothes. And instead you say in a very uh, pious manner, I'll pray for you, but you're not getting my food or my clothes. Yeah. And, and, and as you point, it's not a salvation passage, but it is a passage saying, Christians, you ought to look like Jesus Christ. Right. You ought to do the things he would have done. And Jesus would have taken care of them. He Definitely. would have pulled them in and he would have had them over for dinner and given them some clothes. And we ought to as well. <laughs> Amen. So the brethren in verse 40, would you equate that with the 144,000 Jewish evangelists? I think it has to include them. I think okay. it's, it, it is probably broader than that. I think anybody who is a disciple who's about the business of evangelizing. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I, you know, I, I mean, there are some who would be kind of like, no, it's got to be equal to them. It, it's got to at least include them. I think it might be okay. some other people. I don't think they're the only ones evangelizing at that time, mm -hmm. but um, they are obviously a, 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 they're analogous to Jesus sending out the apostles. These are some very, they're, they're handpicked people who he sends out. And in that sense, there's a, a strong connection, obviously. Okay. Excellent. Well, I think there's a lot of clarity in that. And I appreciate the understanding. I want to get to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter two. So we got verses 11 through 13 of Ephesians 2, where I really want to uh, talk about verse number 12, that time being you are without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants, you know, the promise having no hope and without God in the world. And uh, there's other passages that sort of allude to the fact that the church 
had become spiritual Israel and had replaced Israel and received the covenants uh, that God had promised to Israel. What is this passage in Ephesians 2, 11 through 13 actually talking about? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, and you, you certainly hear that teaching from, from here. You hear it from a verse in Romans 9, but um, one, Israel was never replaced, but two, is, is that's just not the context here in Ephesians. Uh, you know, he's writing to a, a church in modern day a Turkey and what was Asia Minor at the time, and it's, it's, it's probably a very mixed group of Jews and Gentiles. Um, Ephesus is uh, a place you can still go visit uh, today. The water moved and shut the city down, but it has some of the finest ruins in the world. It's a very sophisticated metropolitan uh, port, and and so he's got a mixed audience. And you know, this is really a, a passage more or less about for, you know, in a way about progressive revelation. How you know in the Old Testament, um, God primarily focused on Israel, mm -hmm. right? He he. Uh, you know, uh, once you get up to Genesis 12 and he picks Abraham out from there forward, it's it's all about, I say all, I mean, I realize that other nations get involved and in, in stuff, but they're more peripheral. The focus is on Israel and the right. promise made to Abraham in Genesis 12 and repeated in Genesis 15 and how and how he's going to bring, uh, you know, Genesis 3.15, this seed through Abraham. Right. Who's going to bless the families of the world? That's confirmed mm -hmm. in in the book of Galatians. That's what it's about. And and as you read this book, you start realizing, what about all the Gentiles? How do they uh, how do they get saved, for example? And the reality is that question doesn't really get directly answered. You see examples of people in the Old Testament, but not very many, who are Gentiles who are clearly believers. Rahab's a prominent one from Joshua two. Mm -hmm. You find her name in uh, both James two, or you find a reference in James two as well as uh, Hebrews eleven. Mm -hmm. um, but the, but the message, the, the 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 covenant with Abraham, the covenant with um, Moses, these you know that that's with them. It's not with everybody in the world. And so in that sense, you can have a verse that says, you know, as Gentiles in the flesh, just, you know, meaning just Gentiles, um, you, you were without, you know, they didn't have the promises. The promises of a coming Christ were to Abraham, to the Jewish people, not to the Egyptians, not to the people in Africa, and, and, and not to the people in Europe. Uh, and that's all it means. And, and, but, but, but this idea where God's focus was so much on the Jewish people, it had a termination point where, you know, because, because Christ would come and down a cross where thereafter, the focus is on every tribe, tongue, and nation. Okay. None of that, none of that to mean that, that Gentiles could not be believers. Um, I mean, Job stands out as, a, as an example that we have no indication he's Jewish. Uh, Rahab's another one, but there are certainly uh, others. Yeah, I'm thinking of Ruth as well, what yep. I understand. Uh, was Abraham Jewish? Would we say Abraham was Jewish, or would, would, would those that are Jewish be of Jacob? Well, in, in a way, it's both, right? Abraham becomes the first Jewish man in the sense that that, that God pulls him out and 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 uh, you know has him circumcised and, and makes this declaration of what he's going to do for him. It's just a mm -hmm. one-sided, unilateral set of promises I'm going to do for you. We don't we don't get that concept of the name Israel, so we might say an Israelite until Jacob has his name changed. Um, and another way we might say that is, and, and Paul picks this up in Romans 9, not everybody who's a child of Abraham is Jewish. Right. I would consider Abraham to be Jewish uh, as essentially the first Jew. However, uh, the point is it's only those who will then come through, as you said, Jacob or Israel, right. who will actually be Jewish. And mm -hmm. Romans 9 kind of picks that up, that just being in the physical lineage of Abraham isn't the issue. You need to be in the faith heritage, mm -hmm. uh, the faith lineage of, of, of him. Okay, so we're looking at a spiritual side and a physical side, because, uh, yeah, Ishmael uh, would not fit that category as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, He's, he, he, was, he was blessed of God in many ways, yeah. but he was not the child of promise and would not have been considered uh, Jewish in that sense. And of course, we don't, I don't think we see that phrase used then, but yeah. Clearly, Abraham is, is picked out to be the progenitor of a nation. Right, and the father of the faith. and Because then even still, we have Esau, who was a, a fa father of Edom, you know, uh -huh. if you will, an Edomite. But 
Okay. Uh, Ezekiel. Let's get back into the Old Testament. Ezekiel Another chapters. Easy passage. Uh, what? <laughs> Another easy passage. Exactly. Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48 are fascinating to me when I first studied it. And I really get this idea that there's a fourth temple that's going to be built. And I don't know if that's going to be accurate or not. And the reason why I say that, anybody that follows uh, Israeli history, understand that there's only been two temples uh, sure. built and destroyed. I do believe that a third temple is going to be reared up. When we watch the, I've been watching the Temple Institute uh, organization for years and seeing that they more or less have everything ready to go for temple sacrifices. So I do believe a third temple is going to be built up. But when I look at the descriptions of this temple in Ezekiel 40 through 48, it seems that it might be a different location, different aspect. I could be totally wrong, but also the aspect of would Jesus Christ, when he returns, use a temple that was defiled by the Antichrist? And so it seems to talk about a fourth temple in these eight, nine chapters. Uh, could you explain, again, multi-questions, uh, you know, multi-faceted questions. Uh, first, what is the purpose of the temple? Uh, what will come of the third temple? Uh, will there be animal sacrifices during the Messianic kingdom? And if so, why? Yeah, so let's take those in turn. Um, clearly, you have this long passage in Ezekiel from 40 to 48 that has exacting architectural details mm -hmm. of a future temple that has never been built. And um, it is not only referenced there, it's also referenced in Zechariah. Uh, and I think Zechariah will lend us a hand on understanding um, the purpose of this temple, but it, it clearly would be a temple during what we usually refer to as the millennium. Um, we know after that there's going to be a new Jerusalem and, and not a presence of a temple in that sense anymore. Um, but the, the temple has um, probably a number of purposes, um, uh, one of which is similar to the purpose of the temple in the past, right? The temple was the place where you went to worship, where you went mm -hmm. to have some uh, fellowship with God in a, in a very physical, material way, because he had a manifest presence there, the tabernacle at the Temple of Solomon constructed, and then in the, some degree, although different, with Zerubbabel's temple that gets destroyed in the first century. So so that aspect's still there, and, and we all do well to, to study the uh, architecture of those temples, and, and there's a lot of significance. What was thwarted in the garden when Adam and Eve, and Eve were expelled um, it is a help for us to understand because the bookends of the Bible, the opening chapters and the closing chapters, present the garden with God and his people together. The garden is not the same at the end. It's the new Jerusalem and, the, and perhaps the entire planet. But um, the Bible begins and ends with God and man dwelling together. In the middle, you have these temples that look back and forward. The inside of the Temple of Solomon is carved with uh, images of trees and stuff. It becomes, um, as one author's called it, like a microcosm of the garden in the past, okay. as well as the one to come. Mm -hmm. um, I think in Jesus's time, when he built his own temple, that it may have some of those those same uh, uh, meanings, except now they're being fulfilled. Now it's much more like it was with the tabernacle, where it was all about the physical manifested presence of God. And in Ezekiel 40 to 48, that's what's going to happen. Zechariah is helpful because it, it is, with the, with the arguable exception of Isaiah, it is the most messianic of the Old Testament books, mm -hmm. okay? Which is why no one reads it for some reason. Because <laughs> uh, the real reason is right, because it's just a hard book, right? Like the Song of Solomon. Yeah. But um, his focus throughout that book is he's the Messiah. The first six chapters form a single unit. He sees eight visions of one night. Those visions are in a chiasm structure to make it even more interesting. But chapter six culminates with the high priest at that time that existed um, acting out something as a picture for us to observe. And Zechariah takes the high priest Joshua, puts him on a throne, and puts crowns on him. And then he basically is saying, this is going to be Messiah. This is the sign of Messiah as a, what we would say, priest king. Mm -hmm. So what he has to do 
to be a priest is have a temple. And what he has to do to have a throne, to be a king is have a throne. And he will have both. So this temple will, will have a much different function. It will right. be a temple where he rules from. It will be a king's temple and a mm. priest's temple at the same time. The book of Hebrews gives us the most theology on this priest-king concept. Mm-hmm. But it's not just there. The first chapter of Revelation says he's made us kings and priests. What's he talking about? Mm-hmm. He's talking about this royal priesthood, to use Peter's language, that all goes back to to the book of Genesis, to a man named Melchizedek, to a book like Zechariah in chapter 6, and, mm-hmm. and, and so forth. So um, this temple will be visited from around the world, just like worshipers went to the Old Testament temple, except now it's more like the tabernacle because the tabernacle the people lived around it in communion with God, and that's what happens in the millennium. That's a uh, that's interesting when you brought up the fact that the temple is going to be a little different, whereas the temple, at least in, even in the second temple, the first temple, we see the aspect of, you know, worship, the priestly duties, the holy of holies, things like that. But then this aspect of this millennial temple going to be uh, a throne and authority <laughs> ruling place as well. Is there any alluding to animal sacrifices being done during that time and there there is and especially in ezekiel and it's somewhat implied by zechariah 14 but ezekiel is quite specific Mm -hmm. and um this raises a a sort of a a interesting question probably a peripheral one but interesting as as dispensationalists we tend to be very focused on a literal grammatical historical hermeneutic Mm-hmm. That hermeneutic demands the simple response that, yeah, there's sacrifices then. But it raises, is, is even those who take that view, you can read Walbert and, and Pentecost and others that take that view, and, and even Fruchtenbaum, and they recognize this demands an answer to the question, mm-hmm. why do you need animal sacrifices? Yeah. But I think Fruchtenbaum has the best answer to this, by the way. Mm-hmm. And, and there's a presupposition in asking the question, okay. why did you need animal sacrifices in the Old Testament? Mm-hmm. Hebrews says it never dealt with the sin problem. Right. So if those sacrifices didn't deal with the sin problem, then sacrifices in the millennium don't have to have anything to do with expiation, with dealing okay. with the sin problem. Mm-hmm. And, and there's no reason to think they do. Um, my best, I'll, I'll say, you know, educated guess, okay, mm-hmm. and, and it's consistent with where most dispensationalists land, is these animal sacrifices or some sort of memorial that they, they look back um, the ones in the Old Testament were like a memorial looking forward, but they never actually provided purification of sins. That's the whole or one of the big arguments of, of the book of Hebrews. Um, only the blood of Jesus would. And so um, it, it may be a memorial. It seems like the one feast that you see referenced uh, to be held in that time, and it's possible the sacrifices happen in that connection, is um, tabernacles. Right. That That brings a fascinating point. When I'm I'm talking to people, I'm talking about is there sorrow, are there tears in heaven and things like that. I look at Revelation 21 verse 4 where it says, God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. Now there'll be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying for former things are passed away. And I look at the fact as a dispensationalist, I'm like, that promise doesn't actually occur until the new heaven and the new earth which is after the thousand year reign, the mess- messianic kingdom, a millennial kingdom. So there's still tears. There's, And so that, that also makes me think if there's animal sacrifices and there's death in the messianic kingdom, then once the new heavens and the new earth happen with it saying that there's going to be uh, uh, no more death, I'm looking at, okay, w- would this animal sacrifices then be ceased? after the thousand year reign Mm -hmm. as well because would death be a universal death because death was a pronouncement of the curse and the curse is totally removed and and so it's just a thought that listening to you speak i've held one view as far as okay yeah there's still going to be tears until this time if you will but then what about the death aspect the sacrifice is just a thousand year period and then no longer after that we know people died during the messianic kingdom they lived to be a hunter and receive christ as savior or not uh but and so it, you made me think of that aspect too from 21 4. Well, it, it, I think you're right that the, the, the kingdom is the utopia the politicians have promised and failed to deliver, and they do it every four years, and we seem to believe them and get dissatisfied <laughs> later. Um, yeah. Jesus makes good on the, on the promise, 
but it's a practical utopia. It's not a perfect utopia. It may well be that the sacrifices continue as a reminder that sin is still there. While, while the curse seems to be uh, lessened during that time, people are living longer. They still may die. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact that Satan can mount a rebellion near the end points mm-hmm. to the fact that people are not totally without sin. Uh, it may be a reminder that, you know, that sin is, is still with us. And, and but, but because it seems that people can still sin, mm-hmm. it, it stands to reason there will still be, it's not perfect, there will still be tears, there will still be some problems. But I think it will be as close to a utopia as you can get without yeah. lifting the curse altogether. And then when you get to Revelation, uh, you know, to the, you know, the eternal state, now it's lifted all together. And you have no indication. In fact, it, it seems, as I recall, it seems to indicate there will not be a temple anymore. Um, and, 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 you know, there's going to be the new Jerusalem. Right. We're, we're now, to the extent that the temple points forward and back to the garden, we're now in the garden. Right. No, I, I love your your information to talk about there's going to be a practical utopian, uh, utopia uh, versus a, a perfect yeah. utopia. And, and I, I love that. I'd make note of that. So I do have to ask a question. Do you think the current uh, temple it, with this rebuilding of the third temple, do you think where the second temple is right now, do you think that's where the, or the Dome of the Rock, I should say, do you think the Dome of the Rock has to move or do you think the temple is going to be reared up somewhere else? Well, I, I think the temple will be put there. I, you know, I wouldn't be dogmatic about it. I suspect right. it will be. Um, I don't know that that means they'll remove the Dome of the Rock. That you may fit another structure there somewhere. Um, I don't see that as necessarily being a faith temple. Okay. That, that, that is, you know, we're looking not exclusively, but at a lot of, of, I would say, not Christian groups who maybe want to see that temple rebuilt. And I think it'll happen. Yeah. That's different than what happened with the first two temples where God, God did the building. And in Zechariah 6, right. it's very, very specific that Messiah will build that, that next temple in the, in the millennium. And, and other people will contribute to it, but, I mean, it, it'll be his, his project, and, and, uh, and probably in part because only he can do it. The, right. the architecture of Ezekiel probably goes beyond what we could do anyway. It'll be interesting to see what unfolds, though. I just don't, I yeah. don't know that that's, um, you know, going to be people who actually trust in Christ as Messiah that want to build this temple. That's an interesting point. I never thought about that as well. Uh, you you have a, a paper that you wrote about Ezekiel 40, 48, the, the temple, right? Where where can we find, what is this paper and where can we find it? I have a website. I will confess it gets uh, updated very rarely because most of my stuff gets on sermon audio. But um, my website is proclaimtheword.me, M-E. Dot you. Uh, and it has, it, proclaimtheword.me, it has a link to articles. And just, it's usually papers I had to write for seminary or something, but the reason I mm-hmm. posted them is they're at least uh, somewhat scholarly. They cite sources. And that one can be helpful because I, I try to present with some quotes, um, a balanced view of the two viewpoints, those who say it's totally figurative and those who say uh, more of a dispensational standpoint, like Walbert and, and Fruchtenbaum and stuff, that, that it's literal. And, and it, clearly the predominant view is it's a memorial in some way. And I've suggested that it may also have to do with the continuing presence of sin, just as a reminder. I I don't know. I mean, people, Mm -hmm. you know, but if it's tied in with the um, Feast of Tabernacles, then probably the emphasis on on the fellowship of God. Yeah. There's, and there's so many questions I want to ask you, but maybe we do another video, but we have some more left to do, but uh, because when you bring up the Feast of Tabernacles and the fact that this is the only Jewish feast that's going to, that appears, it's going to be kept for eternity, according to Zechariah 14 and stuff like that. And then the trees for the healing of the nation, you know, I just, I don't want to get into that now, but uh, I want to get you back on and pick your brain some more. It's not every day uh, we're able to do that, but I want to move on to Revelation 11, as well as I think it's Zechariah chapter four, when you have uh, uh, the two candlesticks, I believe they are. Uh, the two witnesses that are going to come on the scene during the tribulation period. What are your thoughts and why? Elijah, Enoch, Elijah, Moses, somebody else? Well, I, th- I think it's it's difficult to identify them as, as uh, people that lived in the past. Um, okay. I've, I've always viewed the, the Enoch view while, you know, while intriguing to have no support whatsoever. Mm-hmm. It seems like he, he's picked just because, you know, he didn't die. Right. Um, but but I don't think that seems to be the point. The point seems to be that these witnesses 
are uh, figures of probably Elijah and Moses. Um, the reason for, for selecting Elijah is because he's the promised forerunner. Uh, Jesus says in the Gospels that uh, John the baptizer could have been the, the Elijah figure had you accepted me as the Christ. And what's interesting is the point is he's not the Elijah, literally. He would have been an Elijah figure. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this future witness will serve that same function. He will be the Elijah figure fulfilling uh, Malachi. I think it's got a passage on that and stuff. But, um, and I think most likely the other one's Moses. I think the reason is because this will be a time of national revival. That's the Matthew 10 we talked about earlier, but a number of other passages point to this as a time of national revival. Oh. They'll look on him who they've pierced. They'll, they'll weep as one weep for, for, for the loss of their only son. I mean, it's mm -hmm. very, uh, it, you know, the cross is said in Matthew or Zechariah 13 to have opened up this, this uh, fountain and all these things. Mm -hmm. and, 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 of course, this all happened in a sense in the first century. But it's really, when does it actually get applied and, and, and sort of uh, experienced? And it's, it's in this tribulation period of time. Mm -hmm. and, and so, um, you know, you have that, that, that tie-in. Um, that means you have to have people doing evangelism. Mm -hmm. And that, that is probably the role of the 144,000. And yet you have these two witnesses. They become the ultimate object lesson. Mm -hmm. I think they preach the gospel in the first half of the tribulation. I think people try to kill them. I think they try to shoot them. They probably try to bomb them. They try to do all kinds of things, but they won't get killed. Mm -hmm. And then and then God pulls his hands back and allows them to die. They lay there for three days. People, yeah. uh, people are happy. People are celebrating. Why? Why would they do that? Because they are hearing a message they hate. They are acting like the people who murdered Christ, mm -hmm. right? And, and they said, give us Barabbas. And this generation will have a lot of people who said, we want Barabbas. Right. And we're so happy that these people are dead in the street. And then there's an oh my moment. They were saying death, burial, resurrection, ascension to the right hand of the father. Mm -hmm. And they died in front of them. They were left in the streets. They resurrected three days later mm -hmm. and they ascended to, the, to heaven right in front of their eyes. And I, I view it, and I think a lot of others do as well, that after that point, no one's getting saved. After that sort of midpoint of, the, of this tribulation, I don't think anyone does. I'm not going to be dogmatic about it, but I think people are just going to shake their fist at that point. And, and uh, it becomes an object lesson, a picture of the gospel, mm -hmm. and frankly, of judgment as well. Well, that would make sense because even at the unpardonable sin, you know, Jesus does say the only sign at least that generation then would have would be the sign of resurrection. And, and I would argue this would be the final sign of resurrection too to the Jewish nation as a whole. And, uh, and so definitely, I, I think sometimes while it's great to think about Elijah, Moses, Elijah, whatever the case is, I think so many times we get focused on the who of it rather than the why of it in, yeah. in that aspect, like you said, yeah. uh, from my understanding, too, when the Jewish people have their Passover Seder, uh, they have an empty chair there and uh, there's a knock on the door and, and uh, or they just go tell them, hey, check the door, see if Elijah is here. And they go and no, it's like maybe right. next year type deal. Right. It's, it's, it's an easy it's an easier argument for Elijah. But what I should have mentioned earlier, what, what would be convincing? What would be a real sign during this period that would would stoke the evangelism? People who are like Moses and Elijah, who are doing the signs, calling down fire from heaven, things like that, mm -hmm. like Moses and Elijah. And so they present themselves in, in that way. But I think that's going to be convincing to a Jewish uh, audience. So I think that uh, you're totally right with the Jewish audience, too, because it made me think as well. Because we know in the book of Zechariah it talks about two thirds of the Jewish people will be killed. You have one third. That's the Jewish remnant that, you know, yep. it, you, you can make the case. I think it's in Micah that they're going to flee to Basra. I think Revelation 12 sort of foretells that also. And so you have to have this Jewish remnant. And so that might be, like you said, the the final point with 144,000 Jewish evangelists, the two witnesses. The reason why it would be Elijah and Moses, because how influential they were to the Jewish nation and how they're sort of like key figureheads, if you will, within Israel. And then at that point, 
you got the Jewish remnant. They're like, oh, yeah. Yep. And, and so the remnants there, they do their fling right before uh, the middle of the tribulation period. And then the two thirds that reject, you know, they're the two thirds that Zechariah prophesies about. You think, I, am I on the right path a little bit? I, I think that's exactly it. And there's there's even some more nuances to it, maybe. When they flee, mm -hmm. it's a new exodus. Mm. They're fleeing the the center point of of the um, the spiritual battle. It is when they're fleeing that they will call out on the name of the Lord for salvation physically. That's Romans ten and Joel chapter two verse thirty two. Thank you. Right, and thank and they you. will they will be delivered. <laughs> well, and and then Zechariah fourteen has one of the most just just. I mean, awesome passages in all the scripture about what happens at that moment. Yep. It says Jesus returns to the Mount of Olives and he will literally create a valley between it. He'll spool with the mountain. Mm -hmm. Why create that valley? Apparently it's going to have some aid to their, their fleeing the city, but it's also going to draw in the enemy. And just as Moses witnessed the splitting of the Red Sea that both allowed their escape as well as the judgment on Pharaoh's armies, mm -hmm. this splitting will be a place of escape, which of course is mentioned in Revelation, like I said earlier, but it will also be a place of, of judgment. It will be a valley of Jehoshaphat, a valley of judgment um, for um, the nations that come against them, and particularly Antichrist, who seems to pursue yeah. them. And I just think on the way, they're going to they're gonna call out for his deliverance, and he's going to show up, and, and the armies that are trailing them will much be like Pharaoh's chariots and find themselves mm. outnumbered by one. Yeah, it's, instead of splitting of the sea, you got splitting of the mountain. And then, yeah, if you just back up in Zechariah chapter 13, verse number nine, uh, it clearly says, they shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say it is my people and they shall say the Lord is my God. Yeah, and, yeah I do believe it's... that's going to be that generation, that remnant that's going to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. J Matthew 23, 39 mm -hmm. is going to be fulfilled. And so when people ask, when is Jesus going to come back? When the Jewish remnant calls for him back. Revel Romans 10, 9 and 10, and then onward. I, I think that's that's exactly it. And mm -hmm. and, and I, I think it's probably not far away. No, <laughs> even so, come quickly. So marriage supper of the Lamb. Yeah. Uh, Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 through 9. Uh, when do you believe this supper will actually occur? And is this supper going to be available to all Christians? Or is it only going to be for faithful Christians who are rewarded to go in attendance? So the, the first question is, is it seems to me that this is immediately before the kingdom begins. Mm -hmm. that okay. that you 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 have the wedding feast to celebrate it and and as as it, you know in a Jewish wedding concept that would at the feast they would actually go privately and consummate the the, the the marriage and that sort of thing the feast precedes that part and it, it, which is just figurative of the actual kingdom mm -hmm. and in the parables Jesus tells um, like the one with the ten young virgins for example if you're not at the feast you're not in you're not going to be in the kingdom. And that, that seems to be what he's saying. Uh, other passages in, in Matthew, there's the wedding parable, and I'm forgetting if it's Matthew 20 or 22, but um, there's the wedding parable where, um, you know, the Jewish people are invited to the king's son's wedding and they don't show up. Then, then the people, just anyone on the road on the day of the wedding, they've already got the food on the table. So they just say, go out there and grab anybody you can and bring them to the wedding. And so a bunch of people come. Then one guy is not in the right clothes. So he gets his butt kicked out. And uh, no one else. And you're like, well, where did all the other people get their clothes? If they just found them at the market and on the highways and byways and they immediately came to the wedding, how can they possibly have the right clothes? Well, Jesus, you know, the king gave them the right clothes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, but you have these wedding parables uh, frequently. And Jesus will talk about even in, in like Matthew 8, you know, uh, making it clear that, you know, as he saves the Rome or, or deals with the Roman centurion, that um, in the future, you know, people are going to come from the east and west and so forth to sit down with, um, uh, Jacob and, and um, uh, Abraham and all these people, and and uh, and and he even goes so far as to say there's going to be some sons of the kingdom who aren't going to be there, and that's caused people a lot of a lot of concern. Now that second question gets to these so-called outer darkness passages. Um, I want to be careful in saying this. It, this is not a fighting point for me. I think okay. within primarily free grace circles, there's a split on this, where some 
I want to say that um, those in the outer darkness are going to either not be there during the millennium or not be there for some portion, but they'll be in the eternal state. Uh, and then there's that are um, that are um, on kind of my view of it that uh, no, uh, the, the theology of the Old Testament, the theology of Matthew and the context of how they think about the kingdom, it's very binary. You're in it or you're out. In every judgment passage, it's just two options. There's there's. What we're doing, I think, is writing the millennium concept of a thousand years, which is uh-huh. only taught in the book of Revelation. We're writing it back into Matthew. You, okay. you, you, you get to bring forward. You don't get to write back. And um, I think that's a mistake. I think that um, if you carefully study the outer darkness passages, um, and, and, and one of which is an outer darkness passage, but doesn't use that phrase, and that's the parable of the ten young virgins, Mm-hmm. Uh, the point is that you're not in the kingdom, and, and, and when you get to Matthew 25, you learn with finality. There really are only two choices, and you'll notice he equates the sheep and what they get, not only with, he says, go into the kingdom that's been prepared for you, right. but he also uses the expression eternal life at the end of Matthew 25. So um, those two are, are together. Um, if they're if if they if they're not in that kingdom, I don't think they're getting the eternal life either. I mean, that's that's my view of it, and okay. um, I do understand there's some smart people who made that argument. I'll, I'll throw this one thing out there. I don't care what your theology is. When you become strongly of a view, uh, let's say dispensationalism. Let's say you think the law is still in force. Let's say you're a reformed theologian. Let's say you think that you have to be baptized to be to be saved. You 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 come you, you can let that view become your uh, hermeneutic. And you start seeing it everywhere. And all you have to do is look at a proof text list for some reformed theology. And you find some just absurd things in the list. And I'm not commenting anything about whether some of the other ones maybe are right. But you get some things like, where did that come from? Well, you start seeing it on every page. Um, yeah. People take an extreme. Total yeah. inability. Mm-hmm. Total ability. Something in the middle that says, you know, people don't have ability to do this on their own. but They can respond to the gospel. Mm-hmm. What free grace sometimes does, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. is because we've done a good job of discerning between discipleship passages and salvation passages, mm-hmm. we've taken it to an extreme where you just almost can't give us a salvation passage. We want everything to be discipleship. Okay. Sometimes Jesus is saying, you're going to go to hell. Yeah. And, and so we get to the outer darkness passages, and I, I think that's an area where a bias has come in that's taken us out of that context. But, you know, again, uh, uh, some people have done uh, Dillo and others have done, you know, good writings defending their position. I respect it, and uh, yeah. so I don't. I mean, I, it's truly a peripheral issue, but I right. do think it's a good warning for us that uh, someone has told me everybody has their theological blind spots. Even free grace people can find themselves in the extreme, and I think we're seeing some of that movement now, where you know, there, there's there's just let me just say there's some attacks going on within free grace circles to further move to an extreme. Yeah. Um, I saw this coming a long time ago just because it's just the way we work and it's not unique to free grace or reform wow. um, or, 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 or any of that. Um, you got to You got to be balanced. I mean, it's just Chuck Swindoll is the one that's always saying that, but he's right. Mm-hmm. Land somewhere in the middle is usually the right place so that you just don't see your pet, your pet thing on every page. Yeah, no, you're totally right. Cause that's how you generate proof text fallacies. And, uh, <clears throat> at, it's like the old adage goes, and I love how Dr. Fred Shea had uh, so, sort of buttoned up that phrase where it says, you know, you have unity in the essentials, liberty and non-essentials, grace overall. And then Dr. Shea says, with theological purity. And I love that little closing mm-hmm. end of it. And so this would really be one of those areas of liberty in a non-essential. It's not crucial to the gospel and saving faith. Uh, but like what you articulated earlier, that a lot of times we'll have uh, this idea of the millennial kingdom being distinct from uh, the eternal order or whatever, when it, it seems like the Jewish people didn't have that concept of a thousand years, because we don't even really get that until Revelation, that they just had a kingdom period, period, if you will. And so understanding it from that aspect as well in a Oh, there was something else I was going to bring up that you, you made me think of, but I can't think of it right now. And that's fine. It apparently isn't that important for me to bring anything else up, but I thought that was great. Uh, last question. 
And again, I can think of like 20 more, but uh, maybe we'll get you on another day after you got some sleep because you said you didn't get much sleep. I'm sorry, no. brother. But uh, I alluded to it earlier. Apparently it is on the list. Uh, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16. Uh, mm -hmm. We read, it'll come to pass that everyone that has left all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year uh, to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, to keep the feast of tabernacles or from what i understand it's also called sukkot uh why is that the only feast that's kept during the kingdom onward and what's the purpose of it yeah i think i think it's a, there's a couple of reasons that it has a particular purpose but um we need to recognize that israel had seven feasts and mm -hmm. chronologically they happen in order during their religious uh, calendar mm -hmm. and so your you know your 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 you know, you're going in order, and as you think about how the Gospels unfold, they they fulfill, and in some degree, the Book of Acts and things after that, fulfill these feasts in order. So we first see Passover. Jesus dies on the Passover, in my view, likely Friday, April the 3rd, 33 AD, but in any event, he clearly died on the Passover. The Passover is always followed by the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In fact, because they're immediately followed, sometimes people just call it Unleavened Bread, and it's the whole thing, and and it lasts a week, and because it lasts a week, there's going to be a Sunday in there. <laughs> and that Sunday is the Feast of the Shiva First Fruits. Jesus is resurrected that day to fulfill that feast and its first fruits. And um, uh, of course, unleavened bread was all about, you know, the Passover was about the blood on the doorposts in Egypt, where, you know, when they came out of bondage, a symbol of being um, able to escape uh, sin. Does, yeah. And, and uh, it, it was the blood of, the, of a sheep. And Jesus is now, uh, as John the baptizer would say in John 1, He's, he's the, the lamb of God that takes yeah. away the sins of the world. And that's what he's doing. It is the final Passover in that sense. Mm -hmm. And and it's his blood on your doorpost of faith that, that now saves you. But that unleavened bread, that's more about getting the sin out of your life and your experience. And mm -hmm. Paul will say in, in the Corinthians, we need to keep that feast, but not in the old way with the leaven, but with, with, with sin, with, with purity right. in our lives. So you see these things being fulfilled in, 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 in order, in a sense. And in that feast day of, of the Shiva first fruits is there because in the Old Testament, that would always happen on a Sunday. Then Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks would always happen 50 days later, seven full weeks, but 50 days later, that happens next too. We're still going in order. You say, well, what's next? Well, what's next is Feast of <laughs> Trumpets, as the, we say in English. Uh, Paul says in, in, in reference to the rapture of the church that it will happen at the final trump. Um, that's not the trumpets in the book of Revelation, those seven trumpets, as, as a lot of people uh, try to right. relate those. Um, he didn't have that in mind at all. He's using a Jewish expression. This is kind of where we started earlier about the Jewishness. Um, that On that feast day, you blasted that trumpet a hundred times, and there's even a special name for, for that 100th blast. And, you know, wow. <laughs> I, I've wanted to buy a chauffeur, but I know I can't do it. it you would think it's easy, right? There's no button. No, it's not. Nothing. We have a lady here at the church that... <laughs> She she blows one every year, and my past senior pastor's got a shofar. It's tough. You have to write, yeah. have the right embouchure. Well, it's tough, and if you ever get a chance to listen to people who actually know what they're doing, yeah, they can make a beautiful sound. I went to Remembrance Day about a decade ago. It was great. Mm -hmm. so I got to hear a, 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 a Auschwitz survivor. Mm -hmm. uh, not very many of those left, but they were playing those shofars, and it, and it, and and now I had a real sense for why this trumpet, such a beautiful sound, and that last blast you were waiting for it. It's the crescendo, mm -hmm. it's the encore act, right? And it's so long. And and Paul says that's when the rapture will occur. That doesn't tell us when, and doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be on the feast of trumpets day. Although some people take that position, but I think it views um, what's happening while the kingdom is delayed, and and while we're in this church age is God's doing something. And there's going to be, in a sense, in his calendar, that last trumpet blast that announces that something's new, this mm -hmm. Jewish New Year, and that'll be the rapture. That's followed by the um, Day of Atonement that spoke about at length in the book of Hebrews, and he relates that to Jesus providing salvation. It's, mm -hmm. And it's during that tribulation period of time that, you know, and of course, in, during Yom Kippur, you would, you would afflict yourselves, Day of Atonement, but um, that's when they will largely come to faith. That's the evangelism, the revival we've been talking about. The only thing that's left is Feast of Tabernacles, right? That's the only one left that can be fulfilled, and that's the why that's the one that's being kept in the millennium. And the reason it's being kept in the millennium is the purpose of that feast. 
they looked back and remembered when the Jewish people lived in the wilderness in the desert, eating manna and drinking water that came from rocks. And they were in such fellowship with God as he was physically manifested at the tabernacle. So it looks back, but it also looks forward because of Zechariah. During the kingdom, he says, they'll keep it during that, that uh, kingdom time. And, and, and we say the New Testament people knew that. Mm-hmm. When Jesus shows up at the triumphal entry, they're there for Passover, but they're cutting down palm leaves uh, as quick as they can to throw it in front of them. Why? Because they're thinking he's the Messiah, tabernacles. Mm-hmm. When, when the Mount Transfiguration, Peter sees Moses and Elijah, you know, which is why, you know, I've suggested that they're the ones that in Revelation 11, but he sees Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And, and of course, what's he say? He I'm going to make them some booths. And God doesn't say, Peter, you're wrong. He says it's the wrong timing. That's the point of it. But why did Peter think, let's make booths? Because he thinks the kingdom is today. Like he thinks, yeah. okay, so this is day one. And when everybody knows when you're in the kingdom, you have tabernacles. Right. And so, um, we as Gentiles don't realize that, but there was that expectation that you see in the Gospels. Yeah. Uh, but it makes sense chronologically that the only feast left to be fulfilled in the kingdom is tabernacles, and it celebrates God and man together. And what do you see in, Reve- or in Zechariah 14? He makes the point that people will pilgrimage from all around the world to come be with Jesus face to face. That's what tabernacles is about. And- yeah, in Revelation 22, I believe it is, or God, uh, tabernacles with man, there will be no need of the light for the glory of God fill the earth. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, it also alludes to the fact that there's going to be some sort of aspect of national identity, too, during that time, at, at least in my understanding. And, and it's fascinating. But like I said, I can ask you a whole bunch more uh, questions. So I'm excited. Hopefully we can get you back on for more questions, maybe after you get some sleep. Yeah. And so if you guys want to know, uh, how much this guy knows and how much just God has used him to reach people for the Jewishness of scripture. Just realize he's running on fumes. He didn't sleep very much so far in just a wealth of knowledge. Uh, as we close, uh, is there any final thoughts, anything you'd like to say, share any books you'd recommend ministries, anything else? Well, on, on, on books, I would just say there's lots of good stuff out there on this Jewish background. Um, that, that stuff's a help to you. It'll, it'll benefit you. Uh, things you pick up from Arnie Fruchtenbaum, other Jewish writers, Charles Feinberg uh, from a prior generation. Excellent book. Um, you know, I've written on Zechariah, but Feinberg's um, a commentary on Zechariah, buy it. His, God remembers. Excellent. Uh, before him, David Barron, I mean, another Jewish writer who wrote a tome one on Zechariah, but glean something from from these people uh, i think that's a help and and then the last thing is just that um my my mentor said long ago um make the bible the one thing in this world you know better than anything else mm. okay and that's that's what i would say to people not 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 to not to be the smart person in the room um i read all these things and i study because at the end of the day if i can get up and teach some people and see that fire ignited in them, not duty, the light in God's word. That, that's what it's about. So know the book better than anything. You can't do what you don't know, but but be in a place where you delight in God's word, and you'll know that you're, you're sort of your you're, you're where you need to be, and and the God's will will be uh, clear to you. Amen. God's word is definitely transformative, and uh, it, it, it's an unfortunate truth that we have so many people that read about the Bible much more than they read the Bible. And I definitely understand that there's a application of reading about the Bible, but if all of our Bible understanding comes from about the Bible rather than reading the Bible and getting the Holy Spirit to do the role of uh, uh, illumination and teaching, then we sort of failed. But I'm going to get that Charles Feinberg uh, book link in the descriptions, a lot of other links for uh, Hudson's information down there, as well as his books, his uh, theological paper, uh, technical paper written on the uh, fourth temple and a lot of other stuff so thanks for checking out this video and leave us a like share comments bubble you know everything else and let me know uh what you think about this interview and go ahead and follow him and can i put it out there that if people want to join your uh your bible study is that able or is that an open invite yeah yeah absolutely so i i on facebook i made a little page called mission 119 zoom bible study and i'll i don't post a whole lot we i'll post once or twice a week 
but it's just a Zoom link, 8 a.m. Saturday mornings, uh, central time zone. Seems to work good for most people. I realize if you're in California, it's a bad time, but then sometimes I have people <laughs> get on and they're not in this country. So I just, it is where I put it. But uh, it's also recorded. Um, I have a, a lot of stuff on Sermon Audio um, uh, going back a decade or more. And uh, book, books are easy to find on Amazon. My last name's Hudson, uh, Smelly, like, like, and the first name's Hudson. No one else has that name. If you search me, you'll find all kinds of bad stuff, uh, but you'll find my book as well. <laughs> Well, that's going to do it for this episode. Be sure to tune in uh, for other episodes as well. And until next time, God bless.